It's been said that there are more atoms in a grain of sand Then there are stars in the universe. I'll let that statement sink in for a moment. This claim may sound suspect, perhaps even preposterous. Grains of sand are very small, but the universe is vast. And even with our current technology, we probably don't know how large it really is. So how could something as small as a grain of sand possibly hold more of anything than there are stars in the seemingly endless universe? It is an interesting question. I wonder if we could devise a means to answer it. Well, it turns out we can. It may not be precise, but it will be reasonable. We'll need to attack this problem by answering the two central issues. First, how many stars exist in the universe? Second, how many atoms are in a grain of sand? So let's explore how we might answer these two questions. First, we need to put on our thinking caps and create a toolbox of several simple but useful techniques. The techniques we need to become familiar with are shown here. They are scientific notation, orders of magnitude estimation, moles, and Mr. Avogadro. We'll cover each of these in the following slides. Our first useful technique is scientific notation. Okay, so what is it and why do we need it? Well, here's the thing. Numbers beyond a certain size lose their meaning to us. Usually our brains don't work well visualizing numbers beyond the thousands, and perhaps we even struggle with that. And then, for very large numbers, you have all those zeros. We all know that atoms are very small, and that galaxies are very large and oftentimes very far away. For example, if a galaxy is 2 billion light years away, that's a 2 followed by 9 zeros, do you really want to have to write all those zeros every time you reference the distance to it? Probably not. So how can we simplify that? Easy peasy. We don't need to write all those zeros. We can use powers of 10. We know 100 is really 10 times 10, and that 1000 is really 10 times 10 times 10. So we could write 100 as 10 squared, or 10 times itself. 1,000, then, would be 10 times itself three times, or 10 cubed. We call the value to the right of the 10 the exponent. We just set the exponent to be the quantity of zeros in the number. Further, we know that 1 times any value doesn't change that value. 1 times 5 is still 5. With this in mind, we can express 1,000 as 1 1.0 times 10 cubed. Thus, 10 billion, that's a 1 with 10 zeros behind it, would look like 1.0 times 10 to the 10th. Easier to handle. And we can use those powers of 10 to determine the relative differences in values, as we shall see later. The next technique in our solution toolbox is estimating things using orders of magnitude. OOM is the common acronym for orders of magnitude. It has a few other definitions, but here we're going to use it to describe a number's power of 10, or the exponent, as the vehicle to compare the sizes of two values. You might think this sounds complicated, but it's really simple. For instance, 10 to the fifth is one power of 10, or order of magnitude, greater than 10 to the fourth. 10 to the 4th is the value 10,000, while 10 to the 5th is 100,000. 10,000 times 10 is 100,000. Thus, if we say one value is one order of magnitude greater than another value, we mean that it is 10 times as large. The example below details two orders of magnitude. 10 to the 6th is 1 million, while 10 to the 4th is 10,000. 
subtracting the exponents, we get two, two orders of magnitude, or 10 squared. 10,000 times 10 squared is a million. Here's another example. Let's say you live 230 miles from your friend's house, but 2,300 miles from your grandmother's house. And if I were you, I'd be heading for my grandmother's house and not my friend's house. 2,300 is one order of magnitude greater than 230. Expressing these in scientific notation yields 2.3 times 10 to the second versus 2.3 times 10 to the third. Subtracting two from three yields one. Thus, your grandmother's house is one order of magnitude, or one power of 10, further away than your friend's house. Utilizing this will be valuable in a couple of moments. Well, no, those are the wrong kind of mole. What we need is the chemistry kind of mole. A mole, M-O-L or M-O-L-E, is a unit of amount in chemistry. It's a conversion number that allows a chemist to move between the microscopic worlds of atoms and molecules to the macroscopic world of grams and kilograms. This number is generally expressed as 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. We'll see in the next section what the basis of this number is. Now on to our last technique. Amadeo Avogadro is known today as one of the founders of atomic molecular chemistry. The chemical law that bears his name will provide us with the final technique we need to determine the number of atoms in a grain of sand. Born to an aristocratic family in Turin, Italy in 1776, he initially studied and then practiced ecclesiastical law. But by 1880, he had tired of law and was studying physics and mathematics under the esteemed mathematical physicist Vesali Iande. By 1806, he had abandoned his law practice and started teaching math and physics at a Turin high school. By 1809, he was teaching as a senior professor at the College of Vercelli. During this time, he was doing research on gas volumes and densities. Several contemporaries of Avogadro, John Dalton and Joseph Gay Lissac, were also studying matter and gases. Dalton postulated that all matter is made of atoms and that all atoms in an element are identical. Joseph Gay Lussac noticed that when he combined two liters of hydrogen with one liter of oxygen, the result was only two liters of water vapor. He had anticipated three liters, two hydrogen plus one oxygen equals three. He further noted that all gases he reacted seemed to react in simple volume ratios. In 1811, Avogadro published a paper in the Journal de Physique. No, that's not a French bodybuilding magazine. That's the French Journal of Physics, stating that the best explanation for Gay-Lussac's results was that equal volumes of all gases at the same temperature and pressure contained the same number of molecules. Avogadro reasoned that the resulting two liters of water vapor occurred because the total number of molecules had decreased. The oxygen had combined with the hydrogen. This became the basis of Avogadro's law. So why have we covered all of this history? Because a derivative of Avogadro's law is Avogadro's constant. He didn't devise this number, but it follows from his law. We discovered what a mole is in the prior section. Avogadro's constant states that the number of particles, atoms or molecules, in one mole of any substance is 6.022141291 times 10 to the 23rd. This is one of the most important numbers in chemistry and the key to answering our second question, how many atoms are in a grain of sand? Our toolkit is now complete. We've covered scientific notation, orders of magnitude, moles, and Mr. Avogadro. Let's now answer our two questions. Our first question was how many stars are there in the universe? We need to make a couple of guesstimates 
the first of which is how many galaxies are there. Past estimates, based on observations, set that value at around 500 billion. That's a lot of galaxies. More recent estimates, based on better observations, like the Hubble Deep Field, puts the value even higher, at 1 to 2 trillion. All of those estimates are quite large, but let's go with the more recent estimates and split the difference. So we'll go with 1 trillion. That number would be written as a 1 followed by 12 zeros. But using our knowledge of scientific notation, we could express it as 1.0 times 10 to the 12th. That's a bit more manageable. The second guesstimate we need is how many stars are in a galaxy. Galaxies come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Our Milky Way is a barred spiral. This means the central area of the galaxy is shaped like a bar, with one main arm radiating out from each end. Our closest major galaxy, Andromeda, is a standard spiral with multiple arms extending from the central hub. Our local group also includes the large and small Magellanic Clouds, which are often referred to as irregular galaxies in that they lack a definite spiral shape. We can't see through the center of the Milky Way to the other side because, since we're inside of it, the center blocks our view. But we can reasonably assume the other side is similar. Thus, based on what we see on this side, we estimate the Milky Way contains between 1 and 300 billion stars. So let's again split the difference and assume the Milky Way contains 200 billion stars. But there we are again with another one of those big numbers. And again, scientific notation comes to the rescue. 200 billion can be written as a 2 times 10 to the 11th. We know galaxies come in various shapes and sizes, with some larger, but most smaller, than the Milky Way. So let's make one last assumption. If a large galaxy has some 200 billion stars, let's assume that a reasonable average for the number of stars in all galaxies is 50 billion. We could use several higher level astronomical tools, like stellar mass function, to get a more accurate quantity but those are beyond the scope of this presentation. So, calculating the number of galaxies times our average number of stars per galaxy yields 5.0 times 10 to the 22nd stars in the universe. That's a pretty big number, a five followed by 22 zeros. Okay, so now let's tackle the number of atoms in a grain of sand. For our purposes, we're going to assume that our grain of sand is quartz, chemical symbol SiO2. This means we have one silicon atom and two oxygen atoms in each quartz molecule. Therefore, we have three atoms in each molecule. We're further going to assume that we have an average size grain of sand that weighs 0 0.005 grams. Oh yes, I almost forgot. We need one more piece of information to proceed. That is what's called the molar mass. This is basically the atomic weight from the periodic chart of the elements of each atom in the molecule times the number of atoms in those molecules. Silicon has an atomic weight of 28.09 and oxygen has a weight of 15.99. Our calculation then looks like this. 28.09 plus 2 15.99s equals 60.07. This is the number of moles in one gram of quartz. Now we can use Avogadro's number to calculate the number of atoms in our 0 0.005 gram grain of sand. We'll divide grams by the molar weight to get the total moles. Then we multiply the moles times Avogadro's constant to get the total atoms in our grain of sand. The result is our grain of sand has 5.012 times 10 to the 19th atoms. Okay, now let's use our knowledge of orders of magnitude to answer our question of stars versus atoms. 
we see that we have 5 times 10 to the 22nd stars in the universe versus 5.012 times 10 to the 19th atoms in our grain of sand. Right off, we can see that 10 to the 22nd is a larger number than 10 to the 19th by three orders of magnitude. In other words, 22 minus 19. And there you have it. We've answered the question. There are more stars in the universe than there are atoms in a grain of sand. But wait. But wait, you might say. We've used a number of assumptions to arrive at this answer. There might be more or less galaxies. There might be more or less stars per galaxy. And our sand grain might be smaller or larger. And of course, you're right. But we can't smack the sand grain with a hammer on our kitchen table and count the number of atoms. And we can't get a 2020 census taker to travel the universe counting the number of stars. So given these limitations, this comparison is a good enough answer to the question. And that's one of the interesting things about science of the very large and the very small. To arrive at answers, we have to make assumptions of some of the underlying values. Therefore, given these limitations, you might want to take our answer with a grain of salt, which of course begs the question, are there more atoms in a grain of salt 